Good evening, and thank you for joining me in today's lecture, organized by the Spanish Embassy in London. I'm Natalia Muñoz Rojas, the Enriqueta Harris Frankfurt Curatorial Assistant of Paintings at the Wallace Collection. Today's talk is based on the research I did for my BA dissertation on the rediscovery of the Alhambra by Romantic travelers. The Alhambra, in the southern city of Granada, was built by the Nazareth Sultans and is now one of the most important remnants of Islamic Spain. The Nazarites ruled over Granada in the last stages of the Muslim dominion over the peninsula. Their rule lasted from 1232 until 1492, when Granada was conquered by the Catholic monarchs and the eighth century long Muslim presence in Spain came to an end. The Nazarite kingdom was formed following the Battle of Navas de Tolosa when after the decomposition of the Almohade Sultanate and a huge push by the Christian armies to conquer vast weights of the peninsula, Muslim forces united to proclaim Muhammad I as the Sultan. You can see him dressed in crimson on the left. Advancing from the city of Jaén, where he was chosen as Sultan, Muhammad I conquered the city of Granada to make it his capital. Soon after, in 1246, Jaén was conquered by the Christian armies, and in order to salvage the last Muslim kingdom on the peninsula, Muhammad declared himself a vassal to the crown of Castile, as seen depicted by Pedro González de Bolívar on the painting on the right. Cornered in the southern Penibetic mountain range, the Nazarene kingdom was able to outlast all other Muslim enclaves on the peninsula. Within the city of Granada, the sultans exercised their rule from the Alhambra. The Alhambra is a fortified Palatine citadel built on the hill of the Sabica, overlooking the plains of Granada. Over 260 years from the time when Muhammad I chose the hill as his seat of government until Granada fell to the Catholic monarchs, 22 sultans ruled from the citadel making contributions to the palaces, gardens, and monumental fortifications. The Nazareth Kingdom lived through a time of decay and decadence, aware of its fertility in the face of the Christian kingdoms of Castile and Aragon. Though it lasted almost three centuries, its splendor did not last until the end of its life, and it came to an end in the early 15th century. During the last century of its existence, the Nazarite kingdom slowly crumbled, eroded by internal disputes and war with the kingdom of Castile. Finally, on the 2nd of January, 1492, Boabdil, the last sultan, handed the keys of the city of Granada to Isabel of Castile and Fernando of Aragon, ending the eight centuries of Muslim rule on the peninsula. The scene is here depicted by Francisco Pradilla y Ortiz on the painting. This was, however, not the end of the Alhambra, as when the Catholic monarchs entered the citadel, they were marveled by its beauty. They left it untouched, respecting it and preserving it in its integrity. In order to preserve the Alhambra, the monarchs gave it its own jurisdiction, independent from the rest of the city. From that point onwards, the city was inhabited by a mixture of Christians and Moriscos, Muslim who had stayed in Spain after the Reconquista and had adopted Catholicism as their religion. They inhabited the towers and palaces, slowly altering them as the memory of Muslim traditions faded and adding to the citadel a few Christian structures, such as the Church of Santa Maria, which now stands where the Great Mosque used to be. The most notable addition were made by Charles I, who made new additions to the Nazareth royal palaces and built the great Renaissance palace, which now carries his name. However, with the arrival of the Bourbon dynasty to Spain, the Alhambra fell into disregard. Its inhabitants had supported the Habsburg during the War of Secession, which lasted between 1700 and 1713 something which led to them being disregarded by the French monarchs once they arrived to power. Without their support, the city became more and more impoverished, which led to the decay of its palaces and gardens. 
The arrival of the Napoleonic troops to Spain brought the final blow to the Palatine city. The French troops occupied Granada from 1808 to 1812 and turned the Alhambra into their military base, destroying and turning many of the palaces into military quarters. Miraculously, the royal palaces survived, though when the troops left, they destroyed the fortifications to weaken the military strength of the city, leaving some of the greatest towers of the citadel in complete ruin. During the 18th and 19th centuries, the Alhambra was forgotten and ruined, occupied by people of the lowest ranks of society, who turned the palaces into taverns and stables, with past splendors now forgotten. However, it was also during this time that the Alhambra became known to the rest of Europe. In his seminal essay on the observations of the beautiful and the sublime, Immanuel Kant described Spain as the most sublime of European countries. Whilst the peninsula had been avoided by the travellers of the Grand Tour, it became one of the most important destinations for romantic writers, artists and travellers of the 19th century. And it was thanks to their tales and drawings that the Alhambra penetrated the imagination of Europe. It was through the writings of Chateaubriand, Washington Irving, Victor Hugo or Théophile Gautier that the Alhambra became a symbol of exotic sensuality and an aesthetic ideal of beautiful forms. This is precisely the topic that I chose to explore for my undergraduate dissertation. In my paper, I tried to establish how much of our perception of the Alhambra palaces and their function was based on the tales of the Alhambra by Washington Irving, and how much of it was funded on the reality of the buildings. Washington Irving was the first to travel to Granada and to share his experience for which he has been given the title of the first Hispanist and the restorer of Alhambra's value. He was the first to give life to the palaces once again, imagining how they were inhabited and describing the luxuries that could have filled them. Irving shaped the way that the spaces of the Alhambra are perceived, influencing the naming of constructions and halls and of the stories associated with them to the point where, as Francisco Hernández argues, it is impossible to visualize the Palatine city without thinking of Washington Irving. Yet, when I undertook this project, it quickly became apparent that it would pose several issues and difficulties. First, the Alhambra has been continuously inhabited from the 9th century up until 1991, when its last dweller, a lady who lived in one of the 45 towers, was asked to leave. As a result of their constant use, the palaces have been altered throughout history to be adapted to the new functions assigned to them by the new residents. Secondly, there is a lack of documentary and archaeological evidence for the function of the palaces. According to Oleg Grabak, it would seem that the Alhambra was nothing out of the ordinary. Its shapes and functions of the rooms were so common amongst Muslim palaces that they were not worth recording. Yet, the Alhambra is unique in its preservation, both amongst Muslim monuments in Spain and medieval secular constructions in general. For this reason, and its sheer beauty, it is worth delving deeper into its history. Despite the difficulties the study of the Alhambra presents, the buildings themselves can provide clues as to what their function was. The Alhambra has been described as the most luxurious edition ever created. This is because of the vast quantity of inscriptions that cover its walls, as you can see from Owen Stern's study of an Alhambra wall. Looking at the inscriptions, we may start to discern the true function of the buildings and separate romantic reveries from reality, as they often refer to the activities that went on in those spaces. So today, I would like to revisit the topic of my dissertation, exploring how Washington Irving's Tales of the Alhambra might have shaped the way we imagine the palaces to have been inhabited. But I would like to focus on only one of the chapters, the one dedicated to the Palace of the Court of Lions. Amongst the numerous palaces, gardens and spaces of the Alhambra, the Court of Lions is perhaps the best known. It is the site of Chateaubriand's tale of the last Aventerraje, written in 1826, 
the subject of numerous Orientalist painters, and it is the subject of the most detailed descriptions in Irving's Tales of the Alhambra, first published in 1832. The Nazareth Palace is built around the famous Court of Lions, at which centre is the fountain after which it is named. On its sides we find the Hall of Mugarnas, which takes its name from its sumptuous decorations, the Hall of Aventirajes, named after the legend narrating how the famous Muslim Grenadine family was murdered in that room, the Hall of Kings, named after the painted domes depicting courtly scenes, and the Hall of the Two Sisters, which takes its name from the twin slabs of marble that make up its floor. According to Rafael Contreras, the architect conservation of the Alhambra, the palace was built around 1377, during the reign of Muhammad V. The beauty of the palace made it the subject of Washington Irving's most detailed description and caused him to revisit the space numerous times during his stay at the Alhambra. Throughout the descriptions of the palace, he alludes to the beauty of the site, using expressions such as the architecture is characterized by elegance rather than grandeur, bespeaking of delicate and graceful taste and a disposition for indolent enjoyment, or the very light falls tenderly from above through the lantern of a dome tinted and wrought as if by fairy hands. Through his choice of words, the palace acquires womanly qualities, which shape the reader's perception, inviting him to visualize as a feminine space. Not only does he give womanly attributes to the structure of the courts of lions, but he also explicitly alludes to them, describing his visions of imaginary women in the secluded alcoves of the palace. He describes the visions of dark-eyed beauties looking through the jealousies and declares that it is impossible not to associate the palace with Romans and beautiful princesses. Lastly, he concludes that it needs but a slight exertion of the fancy to picture a pensive beauty of the harem, loitering in these secluded homes of oriental luxury. Through this means, and the description of the palace as a distinctly feminine site, he invites the reader to exert his fancy and imagine beautiful women wandering through the alcoves and the courtyard. Irving's words did not fall on deaf ears. The numerous artists who visited the Alhambra after him often depicted the palace of the Court of Lions as a characteristically feminine space. For example, Giraud de Pongay created numerous drawings of the court depicting lovers and troubadours, and Owen Jones, the British architect who first studied the architecture and ornamentation of the Alhambra in detail, places the harem in the rooms above the Hall of Aventerrajes, one of the alcoves surrounding the court. This view of the spaces has prevailed through time. If one were to read through the multiple tourist guides written about the Alhambra, all of them, from the time of Torres Borras' first guide to the last edition, placed the RM in this very court. Yet, Irving wasn't an Orientalist or a specialist on the subject. The associations he made with the palace and the feminine connotations he gave to it seem to have been purely intuitive, which in turn raises the following question. What, why does the palace give this impression? The Palace of the Court of Lions has an open plan structure, with all rooms facing inwards towards the garden and with no openings towards the outside. This is the structure of an enclosed garden, or an ortus conclusus. It corresponds with the Arab idea of paradise and with the word harem or haram, which means sanctuary. There are indeed numerous details in the decoration which invite the viewer to imagine a paradise. The columnades, which surround the courtyard, successfully recreate the impression of a forest, since they are closely placed together and crowned with capitals decorated with vegetal motifs. The running water trickling from the fountain in the centre of the court and the smaller ones in the four holes on its sides cools down the temperature, bringing great delight to those who have been outside in the heat, 
recreating the impression of an oasis in the middle of the desert. The stucco work in all of the alcoves is extremely intricate, and it has often been pointed out by visitors that it invites to indolent observation, as this is the only appropriate method to discover and understand the patterns. These, and most notably those of the Dome of the Hall of the Two Sisters, seem to constantly evolve and change so that new details can be perceived when looking at it from different perspectives. Most importantly, the inscriptions which decorate the walls of the Palace of the Court of Lions allude to paradise or an oasis, inviting to relaxation and enjoyment of the pleasures brought by the stucco decorations and the abundant water running through the fountains and canals. One of the most notable inscriptions is found copied twice, the first time around the dome crowning the Hall of the Two Sisters, and once again in the Hall of Aventerrajes. It reads, There is a splendid dome, peerless, whose hidden and manifested beauties you will see, and in its patios present themselves to serve and delight better than the slaves of the Sultan. These verses allude to the visible beauties of the dome's decoration, as well as to the beauties hiding behind them. The role of both the decoration and the beautiful woman hiding behind the mocarnas is to serve and delight the residents of the palace. The allusion to women in these inscriptions, combined with the water and rich decoration, seem to indicate that this was a place of enjoyment and relaxation. It is a marble and stucco representation of paradise. Indeed, many of the inscriptions on the walls describe it as Muhammad V's Garden of Joy. Perhaps then, Washington Irving was right when he wrote that the peculiar charm of this old dreamy palace is its power of calling up vague reveries and picturings of the past, and thus clothing naked realities with the illusions of the memory and the imagination. The centrality of the shapes, with sinuous profiles and changing contours that transform in the sun, and the water that flows in and out of the holes unifying the space, creates a central hole. This is a place of enjoyment and relaxation, which, as Grabar argued, does not have a specific function. It could be adapted to any activity, but as a result of the activity being carried out in those holes, it would immediately turn into an enjoyable and pleasurable experience. Grabar compares the palace to the pavilions of Chetel Sutun and Has Behest in Isfahan, Iran. They do not hold any outstanding physical similarities yet their function might be similar to that of the Alhambra Palace. This pavilion's primary function was that of a private space designed to bring pleasure and divertisement to its inhabitants. Perhaps it is the abstract nature of the Alhambra's decorations which allows for different interpretations of its function, but whichever this one might be, it is often one which alludes to the decadent luxuries of Spain's Muslim past. It is therefore not surprising that Washington Irving was inspired with such reveries of beauty and pleasure, and compelled to visualize dark-eyed beauties walking through the columnades, since that is indeed what the palaces were intended for. That our view of the Alhambra may forever be marked by 19th century visitors, it is perhaps hard to avoid. As you have seen from today's presentation, it's easy to visualize the palaces only through their eyes. This is indeed the true beauty of the Alhambra. Its stucco walls, colored tiles, and fountains have the power to recall images of the past, whether that may be of the 19th century or beyond.